North Carolina's victory over Miami on Saturday, it wasn't beautiful or perfect or ideal. But do you know what it was? It was an ACC road victory. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Monday, February 12th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I am your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for joining us to get your Tar Heels content every day. Seriously, thank you for making us your first watch or listen. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. I want to thank you every day for joining us as always. If you're new to the show or a return guest, we're so glad that you're here as well. Come join us in the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community. All right, here we go. North Carolina beats Miami 75 to 72. They run their record to 19 and 5 overall, 11 and 2 in the ACC, hanging on to first place. Virginia won, Duke won, but the Tar Heels are still up. Ken Palm, uh, as of Sunday afternoon, which is when I'm recording this, trying to get it in before the Super Bowl starts. Uh, heels are eighth at Ken Palm, 28th in offensive efficiency, sixth in defensive efficiency. The net refresh as of Sunday morning, Carolina comes in at 10th, no movement there. And the good news, this was another quad one win added to the Carolina's resume. So they are six and four in quad one games, 10 and four in quad one and two combined. Because the good news is Carolina has no quad two losses. But the bad part about that is the reason they don't have any quad two losses is that after Georgia Tech lost to Louisville on Saturday, that turned into a quad three loss. So that is not good on Carolina's resume. We'll see if Georgia Tech can help out going forward. <laughs> Carolina, 6-1 and one on the road now uh, this season. That means they are guaranteed to have a winning record on the road. Three remaining road games, Syracuse on Tuesday, at Virginia in a couple Saturdays, and then at Duke to wrap up the regular season. Another ACC thing that's good news is Carolina has now clinched no worse than 12th place in the ACC. They could lose literally every game the rest of the regular season and at, at worst would finish 12th because there are three teams that mathematically cannot now overtake Carolina. We'll have more and more of those as the days go on. Um, if you missed our live postcast after the game, I'm going to link to that right up here right now. And if you're watching, if you're listening to this, it's in your audio feed and you can go back and find it there. So I, I started off by saying in the cold open that this game, Carolina wins by three. I mean, just hangs on by the skin of their teeth, had some miscues down the stretch, but were able to get just enough plays to make it happen. And so it was not beautiful or perfect. This was not how you would draw up a victory, especially a victory in which you had double-digit leads in each half and pooped them away. But it was a victory. It was an ACC victory, and it was a road ACC victory. And oh, by the way, one that was a quad one victory against a team in Miami that has not been what we expected them to be this year, but by a Miami team that is extremely talented, that was picked second in the ACC preseason standings. And so still... Going down there and winning, getting Coach Hubert Davis's first win ever against Miami is big time to be able to do. And that's ultimately, I don't care how you got there. I don't need you. This isn't math class. I don't need me to show you your work. I just need me to show you that you got the answer right. And that's what the Tar Heels did. Because in the win or loss column, this one goes in the win. And are there things to fix? Absolutely. We're going to get to those in the second segment of today's show. But what I want to talk about first is the two things that I thought were the single most important factors in this victory. The first of which was Carolina's second half defense. We talked about it coming into this game. Six of Carolina's last seven opponents have scored over a point per possession. Carolina has not been able to hold teams to 70 or fewer points like they had been doing throughout their winning streak. And as of the halftime of this Miami game, it was going to be that again. Miami scored 41 points in the first half, led by a point. And so, you know, if you do that again, you're getting up over 80, 82 points, points per possession. 
looks again like it's going to be another team scoring over one point per possession. Miami was 1.171 at halftime. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm tweeting this out at half like, oh man, Carolina has a lot of work they got to do in this second half. Uh, well, uh, you know, um, the biggest thing being to to stop Norchad O'Meer and Wug- and Wuga Poplar, uh, Nigel Pack from what they've been doing. Um, amongst other things, but that's that's the head of the snake in this one. Well, second half, they come out, and Carolina does the job, and that to me is what wins this game. It, it holds them off long enough that even when Carolina's offense wasn't doing the things they needed to do down the stretch, they had held the Hurricanes in check. So first half, points per possession, 1.171. Second half, 0.88. Six. That means Miami finishes for the game 0.986 in points per possession. The Tar Heels did the job for just the second time in the last eight games. Also, holding Miami down in the second half, not allowing them to get up over 40 again, scored, in fact, cut it by 10, cut them down to 31 points in the second half. That is what the Tar Heels are looking for to hold teams to much, much, much better. We love to see it. All right, now, specific to Norchad O'Meara and Nigel Pack. Those two dudes, Nigel Pack, 18 points in the first half, Norchad O'Meara, 16. That means they combined for 34 of those 41 first half points. So for Carolina, that was that was the key. And you know who the, the main dude guarding both of them were? Norchad O'Meara, Armando Baycott, Nigel Pack, RJ Davis. A lot of that is Seth Trimble being out. We'll talk about that later. But it, it's going to then fall to RJ. And both of them took this um, responsibility so well on in the second half. So instead of 34 points in the second half, Omir and Pack score six. Now, I know Nigel Pack was a bit banged up. That factors into it as well. But it wasn't the only thing, right? And and it wasn't until midway through the second half when he went out injured. But he still came back and played. As for Omir, Armando did a great job getting him into foul trouble, like backing him down, sealing him off, forcing Omir to foul him. That sent him to the bench with three fouls. And then he just wasn't able to do as much. And there were other individual moments. RJ blocked Nigel Pack. Uh, Mondo got that critical block on Norchad O'Meara that would have tied the game with about 20 seconds left or whatever it was. Um, and so, so you love those. So in the second half, it took almost 12 minutes for either of these dudes that scored a combined 34 in the first half to score. O'Meara scored with 8.09 remaining in the second half. That's phenomenal. And then for Nigel Pack, he got um, he didn't score until there were 721 remaining. And so Carolina's ability to come out and do what they needed to do defensively in the second half was so critical and so key in this game. Now, the other thing that I thought was a massive factor was Elliot Cadeau's performance. You you saw it in your game team. Now, look, let's get this out of the way first. Elliot had some freshman moments. There were the turnovers to go with all the good numbers I'm about to tell you. Elliot had five turnovers of Carolina 16. So let's just put that on the mat and then scoot it off because there was so much else that he did that was great that I just want to get that the, the negative in and gone. Um, here's the thing with Elliot. You know what you're getting night in and night out, more or less, from R.J. Davis, from Armando Baycott, and from Harrison Ingram, from RJ. It's performing like an All-American from Armando. It's just being steady and consistent when his team gets him the ball. And from Harrison, it's just doing everything you need him to do, whether it's making a couple threes, grabbing a bunch of rebounds, whatever, Harrison will do it. The question marks on a on a game-in, game-out basis are Elliott and our, uh, excuse me, Cormac Ryan, and then the bench. Elliott Cadeau in this game was the great version of himself. We got a really, really strong performance from him, including scoring career high in points, 19. He was seven of 14 from the field, two of six from three. My man hit a couple threes, his first two threes of calendar year 2024. You've probably seen the quotes following the game, um, but this man has been in the lab just getting up shots and shots and shots. I hope that it is paying off for him. No one is more relieved about seeing that happen than Elliot himself. So like you remember, Duke tried to in, instill this like, hey, we're going to play off. Elliot Cadeau make somebody else beat us. We're going to double Armando off of his guy. If Elliot can start doing this, 
with any level of consistency. That, that's the thing. Can, can this shooting be the standard going forward the rest of the year? Maybe, maybe not. But even if it's just enough to put a question, a second thought in a defender's head about coming off of him, to put enough thought in a coach's head about, do we really want to double off Cadeau? I mean, that like that alone is enough to give Armando the space he needs inside, to give the other guards and wings the space they need to do what they need to do. So this is massive for Elliot to do this. And again, will it be consistent? I don't know. But it happened on Saturday, and hopefully that can be a start. Um, I mean, and, and and it wasn't just the scoring. He's diving on the floor, making plays, getting strips. By the way, four steals for Elliot Cadeau in this game. I mentioned the five turnovers because I want to come back and say my dude had eight assists, eight to five assist to turnover ratio on the road against a very athletic Miami team. Another critical thing, just one foul that, that Elliot committed. Gr- great stuff. And we're going to talk about the start that Carolina had in a little bit, but Elliot Cadeau was the key in, in keying that start, was responsible for scoring or assisting on 12 of Carolina's first 15 points that led to Jim Laraniega calling a timeout. My man was controlling this basketball game at a lot of points of it, and that's what he needs to do consistently the rest of the season. So second half defense, Elliot Cadeau equals a big win for the Tar Heels in Coral Gables. Now, the Tar Heels also, as I said, had some things that were less than ideal in this game. They've got to close better um, down the stretch of, of the first half and at the end of the game. And also, RJ's been having a little trouble shooting lately from two, but not from three. What's up with all that? We'll talk about it in just a second, right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn Jobs isn't just some other job board like those that you find. They've got this vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire and give you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process really easy and really intuitive for you. So hiring is really easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make this process easier. They even just launched a feature to help you write job descriptions, making this process even more efficient than it already was. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, I want to move next into talking about several things that Carolina I thought needed to clean up on Saturday. And there were actually several of them. And so just want to dive right in. And we're going to start interestingly with RJ Davis, who had a big like dichotomy between his first and second half shooting splits and also between his two point and three point field goal attempts. Stay with me. RJ has not been shooting very efficiently lately from two specifically in the last three games, three of 11 from two, two of 10 from two. And then in this one, one of eight from two, but in that exact same stretch, listen to his three point shooting numbers, two of three, five of 12, five of 11 much better field goal percentage from three than from two. Now in this game specifically, RJ in the first half was five of nine from the field, four of six from three. Really good stuff. But then in the second half, listen to this dive that the numbers take. One of 10 from the field, one of five from three. But interestingly, remember we just talked about Nigel Pack kind of taking being held down in the second half first half even even more efficient than rj seven of nine from the field and the same four of six from three in the second half it's it like mirrors rj almost identically one of eight from the field o of two from three so neither of these players had a productive or efficient second half shooting percentage i want to focus in on our guy rj and and try to think about why his shooting tanked the way it did well first off He played 38 minutes and 59 seconds in this game, including all 20 of the second half. 
And so if you're just doing, you know, your usual offensive things and doing decently on defense, fine, great, whatever. So part of RJ not shooting as well in the second half is a function of no, uh, of no Seth Trimble, right? Like being able to spell you, take some of those minutes, but it's also because when Seth would be in a big, big part of what he would be doing is taking the critical defensive assignment on Nigel Pack. Now, I, I obviously we don't know that because it didn't happen, but you can assume just like we had talked about with Joe Girard against Clemson earlier in the week, that's how this would have played out is Seth would have had a lot of that defensive responsibility. And so RJ had to take that on in the second half and take it on. He did. We already talked about what Pack did or frankly didn't do in the second half. And so what I love is this willingness to take the take on the onus of the second half defensive assignment of just shutting down Nigel Pack. Y'all, if you've never played basketball, you perhaps don't understand, but doing playing defense at that level takes so much out of you. It zaps your legs. It zaps some of your energy um, to the point of where you just aren't getting as much lift or as good form on your shots. And so there's this natural, like RJ's playing a ton and he's expending more energy than typically done on the defensive end as he's trying to stop, you know, get into Nigel Pack and slow him down. But I want to shift from this being a negative or a critique about RJ's second half shooting and turn it into a positive because this is your star saying, coach, I will do absolutely anything you need me to do if it means that it helps our team and we can win a basketball game on the road. So if it's better for this team for me to go out and lock down Nigel Pack in the second half and maybe my shooting numbers aren't as strong, I'm in. You tell me what to do. If it helps the team, I'm diving for loose balls as RJ did off a Harrison Ingram tip tip around, like just a little poke. (laughs) If it helps the teams, I'm going to go to the basket, uh, to the rebounding glass a little more where RJ got seven rebounds, all of them on the defensive end. If it helps the team, I'm going to distribute some five assists. If it helps the team, I'm going to get in and get some steals, two of steals. And we already talked about it, but he also had a block on Nigel Pack. If it helps the team, I'm going to get to the line as much as I can, where, by the way, he was perfect for the first time in seven or eight games, eight for eight, RJ was. If it helps the team, I'm going to be as productive as I can from where I can be productive. Now, RJ, just like Elliot, had had a couple like, eh, wasn't awesome. You know, R, RJ did have, uh, what was it, three turnovers, I believe, to his five assists. Had a couple, one or two questionable shots. Um, but it, it's the kind of thing where Hubert, Hubert Davis said it perfectly after the game. You cannot measure RJ Davis by his height. You can only measure him by his heart. And that's so true. This young man, despite everything he's done to score this season, which he did again, 25 points is helping the doing anything he can. That's what you want out of a star because then everyone else falls in line and says, what do I got to do? The other thing that Carolina just want to critique some in this game is their ability or sometimes inability to close out halves or games. For example, in the final stretch of this game, the uh, Elliot Cadeau got a layup with four minutes and seven seconds left, and Carolina had a nine-point lead at that point. You feel good about that. I mean, you'd love always love it to be more, but a nine-point lead with four to go, I'm in. But in that final four minutes, Carolina had four turnovers, was 0 of 2 on field goals, 0 of 1 on threes, and just 3 of 6 at the free throw line. Now, again, thankfully, they made enough just nitty-gritty plays to seal this thing off. But, man, that that you're making it tougher on yourself than you have to. Some of that is just little things. Like, w- there, there was the Armando Baycott block we talked about earlier on Norchad O'Meara. After that, he very smartly got the ball to RJ. RJ is doubled and has to give it up to Harrison Ingram, who's still in the backcourt as well. Harrison could have very quickly just turned around and given it back to RJ because he's the one you want going to the free throw line. But Harrison held on to it and he did not go to the free throw line and make two or two. Like, it's just things like that. Do you want Carolina's all time leading free throw shooter by percentage at the line? Or do you want Harrison Ingram, who's like 56% from the line? You, you just those, even just those little tiny mental mistakes can come back to bite you. And thankfully, they didn't. Um, another part of this for me was that Carolina went to their half court, um, like run, kill the clock 
a little bit too early. We saw some glimpses of it at the around in in the three minute area, but really like with two fourteen left, Carolina's only up five, and they're just running the clock. To me, at that point, and and I know it's like if you run clock and miss, at least you've run clock. If you don't run clock and miss, you've both missed and you haven't run clock. So I I, I hear some of that argument, but Carolina was not like on that specific possession. Elliot had a turnover after he was trapped. It's it's some of these things where um, there there have been a couple times this year where I've thought it was really wise when Carolina went to some clock kill. This this wasn't as strong there. Uh, the other two things I want to quickly just critique from the game is Carolina falling in love with the three point shot in the first half while also not establishing enough of a post presence. They were too reliant from deep. They took 33 total field goals in the first half. 19 of those were threes. Now they did make seven. That's a good percentage, but they took just, that's 57.6% of your shot attempts are threes. Meanwhile, Armando Baycott only had three shot attempts in the first half. I'm, I'm okay with taking threes and uh, especially when you're making seven out of 19, but you would like to see a better balance. Like even if you just pulled out four or five of those and gave those to Mondo where Mondo instead of three field goal attempts has six, seven, eight, and maybe you're sitting at 14, 15, three point attempts. That balance would feel a lot better to me. For example, in the second half, Carolina had 26 field goal attempts and only 12 of them were threes. That's obviously just shy of half. Armando still, I would like to see a couple more field goal attempts, but he didn't have five. So it came up. It's a better balance. But you look at Armando for the game, he was five of eight. He's been really efficient from the field. So get him more opportunities. And I know, uh, you know, Miami, like many other teams, had doubled Mondo, but still, you've got to be more insistent. And, and he did a much better job of it in the second half, I will admit as well, of like sealing off Omir and demanding the ball. So all of it goes together. And then the, the last kind of critique here is the bench play. Uh, one of the lowest bench games in terms of minutes played. And obviously hear me say Seth Trimble being out factors into that critically. Um, uh, And again, Wojcik was the prime beneficiary of those minutes, but just one bench point in the entire game. That's clearly a season low. And that was a Zayden high free throw. So um, just as the season wears on, Carolina is going to have to figure out how to find at least a little bit more bench production. And hopefully Seth is back soon and there's your sixth man. But either one or both of the Jalen's, Paxson, so, you know, and Paxson's just shown some good savvy play, some some aggressiveness in these minutes he's been in these last two games. But the, the Tar Heels need a reliable seventh and eighth man to round out the starting five in Seth. And so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Now, we had on Friday, instead of an, uh, a four corners preview, we had an eight corners preview because there was just so much we wanted to look at. I've already hit on one of those. So we're going to look at seven of them, including the incredible start that the Tar Heels had to this game, plus a quick weekend rip around, whip around. We'll do all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, North Carolina, the wait is almost over. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is coming to the Tar Heel State. It's great news. On March 11th, you'll finally be able to bet on all your favorite teams in all your favorite sports. With FanDuel, there's tons of ways for you to get in on the action. You can bet on everything from the money line to under and overs to which team will win this year's Tobacco Road rivalry coming up in a few weeks, all on an app. That's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, with live betting, you can even pick which player will put up the next bucket and the one after that and so on. See for yourself why FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on so that you can be the first to know when FanDuel goes live in North Carolina. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel. All right, as I said, we're going to do a seven corners recap. We had eight on Friday. We already talked about one of them. That was Carolina's defense, and we want to get to the rest. First of which was Carolina's start against a similarly desperate team like Clemson was earlier in the week. Uh, this, This start to the game was almost identical, but thankfully flip 
reversed mirror image identical because instead of the Tar Heels being down 15 to two, they were up 15 to four off to an eight to two start, got a kill shot. Miami started the game 2-0. Carolina went on a 10-0 run and a Cormac Ryan three just under 16 minutes made it 15 to four and forced coach Larinaga to use his first timeout. Couldn't even wait for that media timeout. What was also important was that the Tar Heels got off to a 14 to two, not start. Miami hit a three to start the second half, and then Carolina went on a 14 to two run. You love to see both of those. Again, you'd like to see them hold that better as the halves wore on, but still, the start was wonderful. And again, don't forget, as I said, Elliot Cadeau, responsible for scoring or assisting on 12 of the first 15 points of the game for the Tar Heels. Great news. Number two. Seth Trimble's availability. Obviously, he was out again for the second straight game. Was doing some work with Marcus Page before the game. That's encouraging to see, um, but was just in street clothes on the bench. I, But I don't want to bemoan this too much. I don't want to say, oh, whoa, were we? We had a player out. We're... Look, there are teams all over this country with critical players out all the time, including Miami who is without kind of their freshman stud, Keyshawn George, who's like a six, eight kind of guard forward can step out, hit the three. Um, he's been in their starting lineup recently. And so uh, Miami being without him, like both players are without a key contributor, really curious to see if either or both of them will be back for the game back in Chapel Hill. What is that? Two Mondays from now, by the way. So playing Miami twice within close proximity, but Again, as I've alluded to a couple times on the show, you really felt his presence as uh, gone. His, felt his absence, I guess, as Nigel Pack was just lighting it up in the first half and then in being able to spell RJ in the second half when RJ played all 20 minutes. Number three in our seven corners recap. I was curious to see if Miami, their teams have kind of gone back and forth on either trying to really shut down RJ or really shut down Armando. In this game, it was Armando. They doubled down hard on him. And, and RJ was really to get able to get untracked in the first half. And so you love to see it. Teams are going to have to choose one or the other, but then look at all the other guys that can burn you. You want to really play hard on Mondo? Great. Here comes RJ. Here comes Cormac Ryan making two threes, whatever it is. Great, great stuff. So I, I'll be curious to keep seeing which teams are going to try to do. Uh, number four, this was a battle of free throw wills coming in Carolina is one of the higher teams in the nation in terms of getting to the free throw line and making their free throws once they're there. Miami, on the other hand, was fourth nationally in free throw attempts allowed 12.8 per game and free throws made 9.1 per game. Well, for the Tar Heels, they were in the bonus for the final 11.45 of the second half. They were in the double bonus for the final 8.40. They did exactly what I asked. I said, you want to force Miami's hand and not let them do what they've done, attack, go get it and make all these things happen. And so for Carolina, remember Miami averages 12.8 free throw attempts per game. Their opponents, Carolina had almost double that 24. They uh, allow 9.1 free throws made per game. Carolina was not quite half above that, but 16. So seven made more than that. In fact, uh, my Carolina took more free throw attempts in the second half alone, 18, than Miami typically averages a team allow free throw attempts allowed in an entire game. Great stuff from Carolina. And it was yet another example of Carolina making more free throws than their opponent takes. Great stuff from Carolina. 15, or excuse me, 15. Uh, number five in our seven corners recap was scoring on the road. We, we talked about on Friday's show that Carolina is yet to score 80 points in a true road game this season. They didn't quite get there yet again, had 75, but it was above their road scoring average, which is 71 while their home scoring average is 89. So great to get up above that. And then obviously, as we've talked about the defense holding Miami down, particularly in the second half is able for 75 to be enough. We'll see if Carolina can get the 80 in one of those final three games. Number six in our seven corners recap, was Cormac Ryan, was it, you know, after going 0 for 6, everyone wanted him relegated to the bench and either Harrison Ingram at the 3 or someone else starting in Cormac's play, something of that nature. And I just tried to keep saying all week long, it's not going to happen. Cormac Ryan will be in the starting lineup. Coach wants to continue to allow him to work it out because there's so many other ways he affects the games. 
Uh, so what's cool is that Cormac had um, two three pointers made in this game. The first was the one that led to that Miami timeout when Carolina got to 15 points. The second was Carolina's first bucket of the second half. Miami made a three to start off the half. And you're like, Oh my word, this momentum is carrying them. But then he makes one to get Carolina within a point, And then the Tar Heels go on that 14 to two run. So he both capped Carolina's 15 to four run to start the game and began Carolina's 14 to two run uh, in the second half. So Cormac doing it, but maybe his most important play was a critical tip uh, that he had on defense with 30, just under 40 seconds to go. Um, he himself was inbounding the ball in Carolina's backcourt, four seconds left on the shot clock. Carolina's up two. Um, he tries to get it to RJ because, you know, they're probably going to foul. Well, actually, they might have played it. Anyway, RJ can't get it because it's this weird sideline thing. RJ tries uh, to get it. He can't. The Miami player gets it and is able, tries to throw a pass. He throws a pass, and then there's another pass ahead to Matthew Cleveland, who looks like he's going to catch this pass wide open dunk to tie the game. And then you're like, oh my goodness, over time we might lose. I don't know. But Cormac Ryan, who was way, 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 way behind the play, comes out of nowhere to tip it out of bounds and save, at least for the time being, Carolina from being tied and allowing them to stay in the lead. Wouldn't you know what the very next play after that, when Miami inbounds, was the Armando Baycott block on Norchad O'Meara. So really critically important uh, that Cormac Ryan can do these kind of things. Not every player um, you know, that's less experienced or not as heady would have the wherewithal to catch up and get that ball tipped out of bounds. Great stuff from him. And then the final of our seven corners recap is the first half turnovers on the road. We've been talking a lot about this the last three games. Carolina had had 9, 12, and 10 first half road turnovers. In this game, they still had seven, more than would be ideal, but, you know, it was less. The problem in this game was honestly the second half, where Carolina had been much better. They committed nine turnovers in the second half of this game, including those four down the stretch that we talked about earlier. So, uh, you really want to clean up both halves. 16 is not a season high, but it is more than you want to see the Tar Heels getting into. So um, we'll see if they can clean that up against Syracuse up there on Tuesday. All right. Shady stat of the game. Assist percentage. You might not have been catching this, but it has been up lately. In this game, Carolina assisted on 15 of their 24 field goals. That's 62.5%. Notably, even outside of this game itself, Carolina has had a 50% assist rate or better now in four straight games. That's the first streak of that length this season. And in fact, it's tied for the second longest streak in the Hubert Davis era. Um, seven is the longest such streak. So great job by the Tar Heels there. That's your shady stat of the game. Weekend wrap up. Unfortunately, women's basketball falls at Duke in overtime on Sunday, 68 to 64th straight loss for the ladies. Unfortunately, they were up by 12 after the third quarter. Duke outscores Carolina 19 to seven in the fourth quarter and then outscores them 15 to seven in overtime. Heartbreaker for the ladies. They got to get it put back together. Women's tennis, unfortunately, loses to NC State on Saturday. So it will not be a fifth straight ITA indoor championship. The Reese Brantmeyer injury, in my opinion, really came back to bite them. And yet they still almost got a phenomenal comeback victory. Just couldn't quite do it. Um, others, you know, several other things around Tar Heel athletics, wrestling beat Pitt over the weekend, 22 to 12 men's golf won the Amer Ari invitational out in Hawaii. Women's lacrosse fell by just a goal in overtime at number six, James Madison, 19 to 18 men's lacrosse won at Mercer, 13 to 15. Um, softball had a four and a weekend, great stuff from them down in South Carolina and fencing both men and women won the Tar Heel duels. There's more to go, but just, we're just rapid firing some of those for you. All right, friends. Thanks so much for joining us again. Come join us in the locked on Tar Heels discord community. It's free. And the link to that is available in the show notes. If you haven't subscribed, please do that both audio and video. If you're here on YouTube, please smash the like button. So we know you're here. And I want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk with you again tomorrow when we get ready for the Syracuse game on Tuesday evening. But until then, peace. Peace.